According to the rishis, the sages of ancient India, the entire universe is a mere appearance or manifestation of an underlying reality, a so-called fabric of creation that's all-pervasive and imperceptible. The rishis called this fundamental substratum Brahman. And their teachings evolved into the body of spiritual wisdom we now call Advaita Vedanta. Their extraordinary assertion is not as far-fetched as you might think. It's actually supported by your own experience, your experience each night in your dreams. When you dream, everything seems completely real. But in fact, it's all a manifestation of your own consciousness. The chair you're sitting on right now is made of wood or some other kind of material. But a chair you happen to sit on in a dream is utterly different. The furniture, buildings, and people you experience in your dreams are all made of your own consciousness. Consciousness itself is the underlying reality or fundamental substratum because of which everything in your dream exists. Right now, while you're awake, everything you experience also seems completely real. Yet, the ancient rishis discovered that it's all an appearance or manifestation of an underlying reality. Brahman. Everything here is made of Brahman, so to speak, like everything in your dreams is made of consciousness. The rishis concluded that Brahman alone exists. Everything else is merely a form or manifestation of Brahman. This radical view is called Advaita, or non-duality. It completely rejects the conventional dualistic worldview, the notion that the world of people and things you perceive is absolutely real. Not surprisingly, this bold teaching raises many questions. For example, if the world around you doesn't truly exist, then how can you interact with it? How can you eat food or drive a car that isn't real? How can you relate to your loved ones if they don't truly exist? Obviously, we have to inquire further into the nature of non-duality. Consider this. Advaita Vedanta is intended to lead you to realize that non-dual Brahman alone truly exists. According to this lofty view, not only is the world unreal, but even the Supreme Being, God or Ishvara, is unreal. An all-powerful creator who governs the universe and bestows blessings can exist only from the perspective of duality. And yet, the same rishis who taught non-duality also recited prayers and conducted rituals of worship. Even today, most traditional teachers of Advaita Vedanta prescribe various kinds of prayer and devotional meditation. These dualistic devotional practices, the practices we know as bhakti, are meant to help you realize non-dual Brahman. But the problem is, how can you pray to or meditate on a supreme being 
who doesn't truly exist. This seems like a complete contradiction. Contradictions like this are certain to arise when non-duality is not properly understood. And because of the extremely subtle nature of this topic, it's hardly surprising that non-dualistic teachings are misconstrued by many, if not most, spiritual seekers. Let's try to understand better. A great place to start is this famous aphorism of Shankara, an 8th century Indian philosopher, who explained what the rishis taught with tremendous clarity. Shankara said, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. Brahman is Satyam, true or real, whereas Jagat, the world in which we live, is Mitya. Mitya is often translated as false, unreal, apparent, or illusory. But as we proceed, you'll see that none of these words perfectly conveys what Shankara actually meant. His statement is based on one of the earliest expressions of non-duality, a teaching found in the 2,500-year-old Chandogya Upanishad. There, a great rishi tells his son, Dear boy, by knowing clay, everything made of clay becomes known. Names and forms are merely notions, whereas clay is the underlying reality because of which they all exist. Here, the rishi used a clay pot to represent the world. The world is comprised of countless objects, and each object is a form, a form of some kind of material. This pot is a form of clay. This table is a form of wood. Clay and wood are materials, substances. But this pot and table are not substances. They're merely names and forms, nama and rupa. This pot is not an independently existent thing. It's just a form of clay. Suppose the clay from which it's made weighs several ounces. Does the pot form add anything to that weight? Not at all. Really speaking, this object is just clay, nothing else. This reasoning suggests that names and forms like pot are merely ideas or concepts. They're not independently existent things, like the material clay. The rishi concluded by telling his son that just as clay is the underlying substance because of which this pot exists, Brahman is the underlying reality because of which the entire universe exists. His remarkable insight is not simply a matter of faith. It has to be understood. In Advaita Vedanta, the teaching that non-dual Brahman is the substratum of the cosmos is not a doctrine that you have to accept or believe. It's a reality to be known. It's a truth that you can discover for yourself. The process of discovery is based not only on the teachings of the rishis, but also on your own experience and reasoning. For example, consider this table. Table is a name and form of wood. So, table is really just an idea or concept, whereas wood 
is the underlying reality. But wood is just a name and form of cellulose fibers. So wood, too, is just an idea or concept. And cellulose fiber is the underlying reality. You can guess where this line of thought goes from here. Cellulose fiber is a form of cells. Cells are forms of molecules. Molecules are forms of atoms. Atoms are forms of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Those particles are forms of mysterious things called quarks. And quarks are forms of, well, science hasn't quite gotten that far yet. But eventually, it will. All this reasoning suggests that science might never find a fundamental, indivisible substance that underlies all material forms. Science might only discover increasingly subtle and minute forms of matter. Yet, all those forms couldn't exist unless there was some kind of underlying reality. This pot couldn't exist without some kind of material. Based on this reasoning, together with deep reflection and meditation, the ancient rishis realized that Brahman is the underlying reality or fundamental substratum because of which the entire universe of names and forms exists. Now, let's return to the quotation, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. The word Satyam indicates that Brahman is the ultimate truth of the world, the underlying reality because of which everything exists. Shankara used the word Mitya to indicate that the world consists only of names and forms. That means the world is less real than Brahman because the world's existence is completely dependent on Brahman. Let me explain. This book is a form of paper, and this cloth is a form of threads. The existence of these forms depends on an underlying material, paper and threads materials that exist independently of the book and cloth. This pot depends on clay for its existence, but clay exists independently of the pot because if the pot gets broken, clay will continue to exist. So we can say that clay is more real because it has independent existence, whereas this pot is less real because it has dependent existence. In this metaphor, clay represents Brahman. Brahman is satyam, absolutely real. It exists independently of the world. This pot represents Jagat, the world. The world is mitya. It's less real than Brahman because it depends entirely on Brahman for its existence. It's not surprising that scholars define mitya as adhishtana ananyatvam, a state of existence that's completely dependent on an underlying reality. Unfortunately, some people misinterpret the expression Jagan Mitya to mean that the world is an illusion. But illusion is a poor translation for the word Mitya. The elephant on this table is an illusion. It has no existence whatsoever. 
This pot, on the other hand, is not an illusion. It's a form that depends on clay for its existence. So, you can see here that mitya is a subtle term. It indicates a dependent state or level of reality, a state that's not totally non-existent like the elephant, but a state that's not absolutely real either. Now that we understand satyam and mitya, we can return to the question, are dualistic devotional practices compatible with the teachings of non-duality? Well, consider the fact that the potter who made this pot was not an illusion. He was as real as this pot. Those who made this table were not illusions. They were as real as this table. In the same way, the supreme being who created the universe is not an illusion. God, or Ishvara, is as real as this creation, as real as the stars and moon, as real as the mountains and seas, as real as you and me. Of course, the stars, moon, and everything else, including you and me as individuals, are just names and forms. And all these names and forms exist depending on an underlying reality, Brahman. To explain this more clearly, Shankara distinguished three different levels or orders of reality. Absolute reality, empirical reality, and projected reality. Projected reality is the reality of your dreams. It's called projected because you project or create all the people, buildings, and things you experience in a dream. Things that exist only until you wake up. Anything you dream, imagine, visualize, or hallucinate is a manifestation of your own consciousness. And all these belong to the projected level of reality. The world you experience when you're awake belongs to the empirical level of reality. The outside world isn't projected by you, like your dream world. It's created by Ishvara, the god of the cosmos. And it will continue to exist until the end of time. Unlike projected reality, the reality that depends on your individual consciousness, empirical reality depends on Brahman for its existence. Based on all this, we can say that empirical reality is more real than projected reality. Beyond these two is the level of absolute reality. From this highest perspective, there's no outside world, no Ishvara who creates a world, and no individual beings like you and me. There's only non-dual Brahman. It's like from the perspective of clay, there's no pot here at all. There's only clay. Now, before we continue, it's really important to understand that these three levels of reality are not mutually exclusive. They can be present simultaneously in your experience. At one level, this is a pot. But from another perspective, it's nothing but clay. Both are simultaneously true. Here's a better example. When you watch the sunset, seeing the sun move downwards, 
when the horizon is actually moving upwards, happens to be an optical illusion, an illusion that belongs to the projected level of reality. The sun, on the other hand, is not an illusion. It belongs to the empirical level of reality. And finally, the sun's existence depends on non-dual Brahman, which is absolute reality. So here, all three levels of reality are present at the same time. Shankara carefully distinguished these three orders or levels of reality to help us understand them individually and avoid confusing one for another. For example, it's a mistake to think that objects in your dreams are as real as this pot. But it's equally a mistake if you think that objects in the world are absolutely real. Now, let's apply Shankara's three levels of reality to the question, are dualistic devotional practices compatible with the teachings of non-duality? To answer this, it's crucial to understand that anything belonging to one level of reality can't affect or interact with things of another level. Let me explain. If you're thirsty in a dream, your thirst can't be quenched by a glass of water on a table next to your bed. Thirst belonging to the projected level of reality can't be removed by water that's empirically real. For dream thirst, you need dream water. But on the other hand, if you dream about drinking from a sparkling mountain stream gushing with cold, fresh water, you might still wake up feeling very thirsty. Only things that belong to the same level of reality can affect or interact with each other. This principle holds true for absolute reality as well. Empirically real problems like poverty, hunger, and illness can't be solved by adopting the perspective of absolute reality and claiming that those problems don't truly exist. To dismiss worldly problems in this way is a terrible misuse of non-dual spiritual teachings. Even though poverty, hunger, and illness are not as real as Brahman, you can't deny the fact that they cause tremendous suffering in the world. Non-dual Brahman and worldly problems both exist. They exist at different levels and one doesn't negate the other. So, worldly problems can't be ignored. And at the same time, worldly problems can't diminish the completeness and perfection of non-dual Brahman. Now, to which level of reality does Ishvara, or God, belong? As we just saw, if Ishvara happened to be more real or less real than the world, then interaction of any kind would be impossible. Ishvara wouldn't be able to govern the world or receive our prayers and worship. Also, much earlier we discussed how the creator of the universe can't be an illusion just like the maker of this pot had to be as real as the pot, in the same way the creator of the universe has to be as real as this creation. So we can conclude that Ishvara and the world both belong to the empirical level of reality. But some people reject this conclusion. They ask, 
How can Ishvara not belong to the highest level of reality, the level of Brahman? Well, first of all, Brahman is the underlying reality that gives existence not only to the entire world, but to Ishvara as well. So, in a manner of speaking, Ishvara is a form of Brahman, an embodiment of the highest reality. And further, as the fabric of creation, Brahman is pure existence, immeasurable and immutable. As such, Brahman is nirguna. That means Brahman has no attributes or qualities whatsoever. Ishvara, on the other hand, possesses attributes and qualities, like being the creator of the universe, like having the intelligence to govern the cosmos, and like being the source of all blessings. Endowed with these majestic attributes, Ishvara is the supreme being, the most powerful, most intelligent, and most glorious among all beings that exist at the empirical level of reality. Even though non-dual Brahman is the highest reality, you can't really pray to pure existence that has no features or attributes whatsoever. But you certainly can pray and relate to an intelligent, all-powerful, supreme being. So, to say that Ishvara is not as real as non-dual Brahman is not a demotion of some kind. It's a powerful affirmation of the fact that Ishvara is every bit as real as you and me. The ancient rishis understood very well that prayer and devotion can be extremely helpful in spiritual life. So, they wisely included these dualistic practices in their teachings, teachings that can lead you to realize the highest truth and gain enlightenment. <laughs> 